And did you hear the sounds of Pennsylvanians cheering yesterday, last night, when it was announced that we finally have a budget? Well, kind of, kind of. Apparently, there were a lot of people. uh, The reaction I got from many people that uh, I spoke with were, uh, it's expletive deleted about time. (laughs) Well, let's uh, talk to a guy who uh, has been very close to this, uh, Representative Brad Roy. Good morning, sir. How are you? Good morning. How are you guys today? Uh, wonderful. So uh, what's the feeling in Harrisburg? You know, e- even though there's a feeling of relief, it, it, it's very, very frustrating. The, the, the governor could have signed this thing a week ago <laughs> when we passed it. For that matter, all we did, the thing that, that's going to become the rest of the budget is basically that legislation we passed a week ago, okay? Mm-hmm. It's basically everything the governor line item vetoed back in December. So that this all could have been wrapped up back in December. And as far as that goes, the budget we passed in December that he partially vetoed was essentially the same budget we passed back in June. So that this has been a waste of nine months. Wow. So let me ask you, because he's technically not going to sign this. He's just going to let it go, right? Yeah, it's a cowardly approach. Uh, he's There's a provision in the Pennsylvania Constitution that when a piece of legislation passes the House and Senate and gets to the governor's desk, if he doesn't sign it within 10 days, it automatically becomes a law without a signature. That's what he's going to do. Was he feeling pressure from uh, folks in his own party, do you think? Oh, I, I, absolutely, because uh, there were about a dozen, there might have even been 13 Democrats that voted for the budget, you know, a week ago when we passed it, and it would have really only taken, you know, less than a handful more Democrats to join with all of us to do a veto override. You need two-thirds vote for a veto override, and I'm pretty sure we would have easily overridden the veto. So, I, I want to know, uh, Brad, behind the scenes, were Democrats saying to you, hey, this is a pretty decent budget. We get a little, you guys get a lot, but it's it's pretty decent. Be- behind the scenes, the Democrats know that there was never going to be a tax increase. I mean, wh- I mean, that wasn't even behind the scenes. Clear back in June, we voted on the governor's tax increase that would have per- would have funded his humongous spending increase, and it got voted down. I think it was zero to 193 or something like that. There were some people missing that day. I mean, clear back then, we knew there wasn't going to be a tax increase, but yet, right after that vote, the governor kept saying, oh, we want more money for this, we want more money for that, we want more money for the other thing. And a lot of the Democrats were saying the same thing, even though they had just voted no on the tax increase that would actually make the higher spending level possible. They kept saying, oh, yeah, we, we support all these big increases for everything. So the, the, the whole thing's just been terribly, terribly frustrating. Are there any potential snags to this at all, Brad? Uh, In in what regards? Well, uh, we understand uh, that perhaps the the fiscal code may not be uh, approved by the governor? Oh, yeah. See, the the fiscal code is basically uh, directions on how to spend the money. So in the budget, it'll say there'll be a line item that says basic education funding, $5.5 billion or whatever it is. Well, then in the fiscal code, the fiscal code will explain that you know every school district gets the same amount of money they got last year. If there's any additional money, it gets driven out the following way. You know, it gives like directions on how to drive out the stuff. And he, he did say he's going to veto that. Now, what will end up happening, it, it won't really have that much of an impact. Everybody's all the school districts will basically get the amount of money they did last year. Everybody will get a little bit of an increase. And then because the fiscal code isn't in place, he will have discretion on how to allocate some of that money. So I'm sure he'll give Philadelphia a disproportionate share of the money, the Erie City School District, the Scranton School District, the, the big Democratic strongholds in the state will end up getting extra money. So, so what we're going to have to do when we do the 2016-2017 budget, we're going to have to readjust that. And everybody that got more than they should have, we're going to have to cut back. And people that got less, so we're basically going to adjust that back out in the, in the new budget year. So we're still seeing a power struggle between the legislature and the governor's office here. It's just, it's... Yeah, which I think the system's designed that way anyways. I mean, you know, 
when they came up with this, you know, three branches of government, you know, they didn't want one person or one group of people to do whatever they wanted. So, I mean, this, this whole system was designed on purpose to be cumbersome and to make it hard to pass laws and to make it difficult to get anything done. That, that, that's part of the original plan. So, going back to the schools, uh, what's that mean for the, the school districts that you represent? Uh, I mean, like if, I said, if, go, go. if if he vetoes this part, uh, are you saying that these that your school districts will probably get the same as yeah, last? M- m- yeah, m- most school districts, though, at a minimum, they're going to get what they got last year. And you know, our school districts around here get a lot of state funding for all the grumbling you hear sometimes. Statewide, Pennsylvania state taxes provide about. Forty-eight hundred dollars a year of funding per student in Pennsylvania. If you average out all five hundred school districts, it averages about forty-eight hundred dollars per student of state funding. If, if you looked around, Titusville probably gets you know nine thousand dollars a year state funding per student. You know, Pencrest is probably eight thousand. What what happens is in the areas that are losing population. There's no reduction in aid that you get from the state. You always get as much money as you did the year before. So as the population declines, the state continues to send the same amount of state funding to the school district. So in theory, every single student could move out of the Titusville School District except for one, and the school district would still receive the exact same amount of state funding as they did last year when the new fiscal year starts. So what that means is in growing areas, an area that might gain 100 students a year, they've gained 1,000 students in the last 10 years, they're not getting additional state money to offset that increase in enrollment. And so when you look at funding around the state, you know, lo- locally here, all of our school districts, Crawford Central is about 50% state funded, Conneaut, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but Conneaut's probably you know, 55%, Pencrest 55%, Titusville's probably 60 or 65 percent state funded. Union cities, you know, 70 percent state funded. You know, as the population declines, the state keeps throwing the same amount of money. So you get a relatively high amount of state aid per student. Well, Brad, I know I'm trying to do my part. Uh, we have about 16 kids now. We're, <laughs> we're going to try to have a few more before, uh, before enough's enough. Um, so the, the districts who had to take out loans and are paying back an in interest, is that just money that they're just going to lose, or will they ever be able to... Yeah, and now fortunately, interest rates aren't that high right now. Yeah, I think a lot of school districts, they were paying you know, 3% or 4%, and uh, you know, the money wasn't even borrowed for a whole year. It was only borrowed for you know, two or three months in most cases. So the, the interest cost is more of an annoyance than an actual you know, devastating financial thing. And uh, uh, now, ironically, the state made interest on, on that money that should have been going out to the state, out to the school district. So when you look at the money the state has, the state actually has more money than we would normally have, you know, because of that interest. So when we do the 2016-2017 budget, there is a little bit more money that the state made by earning interest that will be you know, driven out in the school funding. So it's, it's not that big of a thing. I mean, it's... it's terrible that it happened. And, and like I said, the, the governor could have... Th- this is basically the same thing we passed back in June. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the governor is just insistent that we are undertaxing everybody. And if you went around Titusville, go around Meadville, go around anywhere and just ask everybody on the street, excuse me, sir, do you feel like you're being undertaxed? Not that many <laughs> people are going to say, yeah. And the governor is insisting that we're undertaxing in Pennsylvania. I think we're overspending, and most people I talk to think we're overspending. And this, this whole thing, the last eight months, has been about his desire for a massive tax increase. We're starting to hear uh, reports that uh, the current budget, now that this is going to go through, and again, uh, Governor Wolf's not signing it, he's just going to let it just lapse and, and officially... Uh, become the law here uh and that happens what sunday the 27th no, monday monday it depends monday. how they count I, I i'd have to look closer at the constitution i'm not sure if they count 10 uh session days or 10 regular days and i'm not sure if they count you know 
Saturdays and Sundays or not. Okay. But it, it, it's coming up. So. so by next week. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. so uh, word is that the, this year's budget probably will kind of get into a fight again, and it might be November before we have a budget. Well, I don't think anybody wants to see that. I mean, everybody, and by everybody, I mean the governor, the, the legislature, the taxpayers, the schools, everybody. No, nobody wants to see this next budget drag out like this one did. And I think what we have to do this time is, I think the mistake we made uh, th- this past budget cycle was we voted on the governor's tax increase. It got voted down 0 to 193. But then people kept talking that they wanted to spend all that higher spending that's not possible without a tax increase. We should have kept putting a tax increase vote up every day. So maybe five or six days in a row, we vote the tax increase down and say, look, we've voted this tax increase down five days in a row. This money doesn't exist. Here's how much does exist. Let's figure out how to spend it. We we, we probably should have pushed that more. Joining us but, this morning. Yeah, no, nobody wants to see this process dr- drag out like that. And you hear talk about a structural deficit. And in some regards, a structural deficit doesn't really exist. It's, it's, a, it's really hypothetical. What a structural deficit is, if you say, okay, we're going to do everything we did the last budget year, we're going to do this new budget year, and we're not going to make any changes at all to anything. And if the costs are higher than what you have in current year tax revenues to pay for it, that's the structural deficit. Well, it's a flawed thing because every year there's money that isn't spent, that isn't spent, that gets lapsed into the new year. Every year there's things that were planned that were planned to do that didn't get done, so that's unspent money. And then also you don't have to keep doing the same thing you did year after year. Like part of the structural deficit would be, well, every year you know, most of the state employees get two pay raises a year. There's the, there's the step increase, which is basically every year longer that you've worked there, you get a raise. And there's the annual pay increase uh, that you get. So those work out to be about a 5% raise every year, which the public sector or the private sector doesn't even come close to doing that in most, most companies. But anyways, so that structural deficit would assume, okay, we're going to keep paying the state employees a 5% pay raise every year. We're going to keep only requiring the state employees to pay 40 or 50 bucks a month for their health insurance. We're going to keep giving all these people on all these different welfare programs that could work but choose not to work. We're going to hey, keep giving them the food stamps and the welfare checks and the public housing, the subsidized daycare. The, you know, we're going to keep having the state have a monopoly on the liquor system. We're going to refuse to reform the pension system. We're, I mean, that's what a structural deficit is. If you say, we're just going to do everything like we did. Now, obviously, some of those things I just talked about, we're going to have to look, look at, and we're not going to be able to continue doing things as we are. Right. And it's not really a $2 billion structural deficit, like the governor's saying. There's a lot of exaggerating in Harrisburg. People try to make things sound no. worse than they are just to press their case. People say, oh, my gosh, a billion-dollar structural deficit. Well, those guys can figure that out. They only have to cut three or four percent of the spending to to get rid of that but if they hear a two billion structural deficit the public is supposed to say oh my goodness maybe we better have a tax increase we have a two billion dollar structural deficit hey brad yes it's great talking to you uh keep in touch okay all right great talking to you guys all righty have a great day and uh congrats thank you all righty representative brad roy joining us uh, 24 minutes past the hour of seven o'clock we will be right back (laughs) 